everybody, and welcome back to the Consummate Athlete Podcast. I'm Molly Herford. I write and speak, I guess, all about outdoor activity, adventure, and, you know, plenty of other fun fitness-related stuff. And I'm Peter Glassford. I'm a registered kinesiologist and an endurance coach, and indeed, this is the Consummate Athlete Podcast. I think this is actually the longest stretch of time that we've been able to actually use our good microphone setup and be in the same place to record these intros. I guess that's true. There, we've done a few, for sure. Yeah, it's pretty nice. So we're back up in Collingwood, Ontario, although only for another few hours before I leave again for the annual NICA uh, mountain bike conference. I'm really excited to meet a bunch of coaches from all over the U.S. that are helping get you know, young men and women involved in mountain biking. I've been to a few NICA events and the people behind that organization are just so rad and it's so cool to see sort of this next generation of shredders. And and this is essentially the USA uh, high high school school mountain bike league for mountain biking. Mm -hmm. And not just for young ladies, but it's, it's both males and females. Yes. Although they're really working on bringing more women into it. Although last year when I did my first NICA event, I think we brought out 25 girls in New Jersey, which is pretty awesome. Like getting that many young girls on bikes in one spot. So yeah, they're doing really good stuff. I'm really excited to get to go down there and talk about, you know, getting more girls into sport. We're going to talk about shred girls a little bit and Yeah, I'm excited. And apparently Bentonville has some of the best, it's like the new mountain bike hotspot in the U.S. Yes, you're going to have to mountain bike, so you're packing packing your own bike today. Yeah, that's going to happen. Anyway. How have we done on our consummate athlete pursuits this week? I don't know, I feel like I've just been riding my my cross-country mountain bike, so I have not done as well, but we had a bit of walking, we were... I don't, I don't know what else we've done. I mean, I've... You did some strength yesterday. Yeah, I, I, I supervised some people doing strength yesterday. I was going to say, I've had a pretty good consummate athlete week. I ran, I walked, I rode, I did yoga. I did my first strength workout in quite a while. Uh, with yoga teacher training, I really kind of fell back on the strength training. So it's been nice to lift the heavy things again. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've been sticking... I really still like that morning 10 minutes of core I have a 20 pound single 20 pound dumbbell and I do a variety of things in our little pull up bar and little stretch band and yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, so that's been going good. And my hypermobile big toe has almost repaired from our long distance hike. Oh, I mean, Lord. I'm going to coast off that long distance backpacking trip for a while as far as consummate athlete lifestyle, but I mean, I'm coasting off of it in terms of how much I've been eating this week. So yeah, yeah. Man, turns out, yeah, 22 hours of hiking makes you really freaking hungry. Yeah, and I mean, I guess we were at this Horseshoe Canada Cup, went really well. Mm-hmm. Uh, Superflyracing.com put on a tremendous event uh, here near Barrie, Ontario. So just a couple, I mean, I guess an hour north of Toronto, Ontario. And there was lots of people from all over Canada and then down in the U.S. I don't know if we had anyone like Mexico or anything like that come up for this, but uh, I don't think so. But parking lot was full. And yeah, was... I had some good friends from the U.S. up there. So shout out to Jordan, who I know listens to our podcast, which is exciting. Mm-hmm. Haven't seen some people in quite some time. So it was good for I rode over. I didn't actually race, um, but I rode my bike for three hours to get there. And that was pretty rad. Yeah. And then they're doing there's another Canada Cup nearby about probably t- 10, 20 minutes ride maybe uh, at Hardwood Hills, which has hosted Pan Am Games before. So that's this weekend. So there'll be a few more people up for that and people staying over. So exciting times here in the area. Yeah. This is also the last uh, last episode that we're going to do before I'm officially in my 30s and not just just turned 30. I don't know if that's a difference, but... I think be. it is. I'm, I'm pretty nervous. I think I did have trouble around 31. I've been... I've been lying to myself where someone asks how old I am, and I'm like, oh, I just turned 30. And they're like, oh, when's your birthday? And I'm like, uh, last June. <laughs> so this will this will be pretty firmly in my 30s. I'm a little bit freaked, but I feel like I need to figure out some really good consummate athlete thing to do. I next think that week. you missed the boat. It's 30. You, you, the 31, it's just, there's nothing. There's nothing to celebrate anymore. It's, I'm celebrating. No, I'm 30. Celebrating like, every it's year. everyone does stuff when they're 29 turning 30, you know, they're going to do that 30 summits or 30 
new bucket list things. I feel I signed it's, a contract it's done. for a three series, like three yeah, book series. That's all in the past. It's over. <laughs> it's over. It's all over. All downhill from here. Yeah, I mean, you just gotta keep rolling. No, no, you know, like heroics. You know, it's just he's just keep, saying this so he doesn't have to away. give me a present. Well, I'm missing your birthday anyhow. So that's true. It doesn't matter anyway. Uh, so today's guest, <laughs> uh, Hannah Mug is a. Uh, She's originally from Germany. Now she lives out in my one of my favorite places in the world, uh, in Monterey, California. So near San Francisco, uh, Monterey. For those of you in the cycling industry, is where Sea Otter is. Um, those of you in car and motorcycle racing would know Laguna Seca Raceway. Oh right. That. Those of you into sustainable fishing would know the Monterey Aquarium. Uh, and those of you into like golfing would be like Pebble Beach is nearby, and then also I think or the Redwoods. They're not as close as people make it sound, but the Redwoods of California. Are near, so nearby. basically, if you're a consummate athlete, you know Monterey. It's a cool area for it's sure. It's so rad. It's one of my favorite places on earth. So she gets to live there year round, which means she gets to ride there year round, which makes her incredibly lucky. Uh, she was originally a basketball player, which I think is kind of hilarious you don't hear that many people turning to bike racing from basketball but she has a really interesting story um she's one of those people that's been just competitive and athletic since as long as she can remember uh which i always find kind of fascinating on the grounds that uh, anyone that's listened to the show knows that i was not that person uh, so we kind of get into that a bunch we talk about you know her daily lifestyle what it looks like she works full-time as well uh, for I believe the city of monterey Um, so we talk about how she balances, you know, racing as a pro with a full-time job, which I think a lot of female bike racers especially kind of have to do at this point, which is sort of a bummer, but, you know, we're working, working on that. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like a tremendous episode. Yeah. The other thing we just realized is we actually completely skipped our two-year podcast anniversary. Yeah, we celebrated 100, but I guess that's not the, the two year. It's just shy of that, right? No, I remember, you know, speaking of California, recording those first couple episodes. We actually recorded the first guest on our episode at Sea Otter in Monterey, yeah, Ryan Leach. Episode three, and Ryan's been on now twice, I think. So. Yeah, and we recorded the first two episodes in Big Bear, California, um, and this little cabin on top of a, a mountain. This is definitely true. Good times. So, you know, with two years in the books, you know, thanks to everybody that's been listening. And I mean, we have to really shout out to a wide angle podium, the network that this podcast is on. They've just been awesome with supporting us. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they, you know, they have a few different shows there. A lot of them are cycling related and you can check those out at wideanglepodium.com. And if you want to jump over, they are listener supported. So you can do that at wideanglepodium.com slash donate. Um, and there's also a big donate button if you just go to the homepage. And so sort of like, you know, NPR or any of these things, they, they work sort of based off of donation. You can do a one time, you can do a recurring sort of, you know, one or five or 10 or a hundred, whatever you have, uh, to support the network or, or just support your favorite show. And Hey, let's, let's just throw this out there. The more people donate, the better microphones we can get. So, well, exactly. And things like the mixer board and things like that so that we can, you know, do a more on location type stuff. So if you've been one of the people that has considered our audio to be, you know, kind of in and out sometimes the, you know, the more donations we get, the better, you know, the more upgrades we can make. If you go back and listen to those first couple episodes, you you get to kind of hear the difference between even, you know, then and now. I think we've come a long way with our audio and what we can do, but we're always looking to improve. Yeah. So without further ado, I think we should just get into it. I think so. All right. Well, my name's Hannah Megan. I'm 20, 28 years old. Let me start over since you're finally recording. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now that I actually have to think about this, all right. So, my name's Hannah Muga. I'm 28 years old. I live in beautiful Monterey, California, and I'm originally from Germany. Um, I'm a professional cyclist for a DNA cycling team, and when I'm not riding my bike, I work full time for the regional air quality regional. <laughs> I can, you know what? So I'm best not scripted, and I totally wrote out some answers. Oh my so, god! I love. I it. should not even look at this. Okay. So 
I'm going to totally just step away from everything and just talk to you. Perfect. So, <laughs> perfect. This will be very nice. <laughs> All right. So, my name is Hannah Megan. I'm 28 years old, and I'm living in Monterey, California. I'm originally from Germany, but we moved over here in 2002, and my immediate family has lived here ever since. So, nice. yeah, I'm... I race for a DNA cycling team, and when I'm not racing or riding my bike, I'm a full-time air quality planner for our regional air quality management agency. That's awesome. So I love I love what you do for work um, because, you know, normally when you have a pro cyclist, you have someone that's working in the cycling industry if they do have a, a full-time job. So what drew you to air quality control? Yeah, so I think my entire life I've been fascinated by biology, playing in the dirt, playing in the sand, going diving, exploring fish, what what have you. And so for me, I came out to Monterey actually in 2012 to get my master's in international environmental policy. And I wanted to work on protecting the ocean. And so as I was getting ready to graduate, I really got intrigued by maps and I focused on geospatial information systems, also known as GIS, and somehow got involved in uh, with our regional government body here. It's called AMBAC, the Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments. And um, my boss at the time suggested she kind of she saw something in me and suggested I apply next door um, to our air quality management district. Um, it's called the Monterey Bay Air Resources District, which is where I live or where I work right now. And um, yeah, so I applied, even though I didn't have any background in air quality. <laughs> got the job, and just because because of your because of my kind of my everything in my past built up and I was able to incorporate things from my study from my undergraduate to do the work I do now and I love it that's awesome but living in Monterey does it make you sad that you don't work with the ocean and like get to play with seals every day <laughs> you know what I actually had my share of playing with seals in the past so. <laughs> Um, long story short, uh, I actually did an internship in Germany in 2011, and I was in the Baltic Sea for three months, and I actually was training harbor seals. So that actually answers that question. Oh my God, that's so cool. Um, Are you tempted to start training yeah. the harbor seals in Monterey every time you walk by them? <laughs> oh my God, no. I think they belong in their natural habitat, and I think they're doing just fine. Mm -hmm. So I don't think they need any of my help. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's like my favorite part of going to Monterey for, for sea otter is going and hanging out with the seals. Yeah. It's the highlight. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a beautiful area, and there's some magnificent diving in the area. But I also i have been to some very warm places. Um, on this wonderful planet and have not gone diving here in the Monterey Bay since um, 2014. I was, oh, wow. I'm scuba certified and I just, the water is really cold. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay. You started with basketball as your sport, correct? Yes, I did. And well, you ended up here. cycling. Yeah, give give me this <laughs> athletic background because it makes no sense. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it doesn't. Um, I've really been an athlete all my life. Basketball wasn't really the beginning. Um, I did rhythmic gymnastics um, when I was in kindergarten, preschool. I was pretty good at it. Um, I was in regular gymnastics. And my life really shifted around basketball uh, in third grade, as well as track and field uh, running. I've always been a runner. I've always enjoyed just going out and whether it's playing tag with friends or, you know, getting scared in a forest and running through the forest um, to just just being outdoors and enjoying nature while running. So. Mm -hmm. 
I, I agree there. Okay, so no, wait, though. You swim, you bike, and you run. And you didn't yeah, go for triathlon. Like... <laughs> yeah. What's wrong with me? I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, you know what? This is what happened. I was really good at basketball. I was just really good. And um, it earned me a full ride to um, college out in Illinois, Bradley oh. University. I played four years of division basketball, different, division one basketball. Um, and I also played for the German bas- uh, national basketball team. So wow. I That's took awesome. basketball as far as I could. Yeah. Okay. And so how far was that? Was that just through college then? And then after college you stopped or when, when did it end? Um, yeah. So for me, I knew that I, I didn't want to play basketball professionally. I okay. kind of expired my, my passion for it. And to be quite honest, I totally burned out. I, haven't touched basketball since graduating from college. So that's exactly what happened. I burned okay. out. I mean, that's understandable. Like, I mean, I used to tutor collegiate athletes and their schedules were insane. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're practicing twice a day, whether it's uh, shooting with, you know, individually with a coach, weightlifting, going to regular pack for three hours every single day and then playing twice a week and it's year round when you're not in the season, you're in the off season and you're already getting ready for the on season. Mm -hmm. And And I mean, for student athletes, you're also trying to maintain, especially when you actually, you know, care about school versus just playing. (laughs) Hey, everybody cares about school, right? (laughs) Yes, absolutely. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, um, it was definitely difficult. Um, I was also getting a double major. I was um, double majoring in biology and German because I wanted to keep up my German. So since I mentioned I was originally from Germany, mm-hmm. um, the last time I've had kind of grammar lessons, so people always ask, you know, why would you study German? Well, it's like people studying English. You maintain it. You You increase your vocabulary. You keep becoming better at what your native tongue is. Well, if you don't have that in your life you know you're living at in college away from your family you're not able to speak your native tongue all the time so for Mm -hmm. me double majoring in with a language was the way to to keep that alive Mm -hmm. and so I was getting a double major but also um still running along um my four years at Bradley um because my senior year I was recruited by the track and field coach to go run um, for their team as well. So I was doing basketball, and once the season ended, I switched over to track and field. Oh my gosh. Okay. How did the track coach come across you? They had been recruiting me in high school. Oh. Um, I was pretty good in track and field. And so, since basketball is a really well funded sport, mm-hmm. I went for the full ride. You know, not having to pay for anything in college was such a, a help. I mean, it's it's a privilege a lot of people can dream of, and but it doesn't become reality for a lot of other people. So actually, my, my junior and senior year in high school, I was re- being recruited from, from universities throughout the U.S. for both sports. And so I went on collegiate visits for track and field to colleges like University of Maine, University of Montana, and Oregon, um, University of Minnesota, and then basketball, I was, I mean, I was torn by, between those two sports. I love track and field. It was definitely, that was my passion, but mm-hmm. I just happened to be good at basketball too. So, <laughs> and I knew basketball ended up, you know, would pay the way. And yeah. it did. So I ended up going for a full ride in basketball versus a partial scholarship in track and field. Yeah, fair enough. So in track and field, what was your, was your main event or favorite event? So I was kind of a multi-event specialist. Okay. So again, not, um, I loved the jumps. I did long jump, triple jump, high jump, as well as I was a good sprinter. I was pretty fast. So I did the 100, 200 meter dash, sometimes the, the open 400, but also the relays. So in Minnesota, the rule was um, you can do four different events. Um, if you're doing multi-events, uh, you can't do... Of those four events, three could be jumps. 
and then you'd have one running event. So that was kind of a, a guide throughout high school. You couldn't just do, I guess, you couldn't do f- four field events. Mm-hmm. So the fields would be like shot put, discus, javelin if you had it, um, uh, pole vault, high jump, triple jump, long jump. So you could okay. do three and then a running event. Yeah. So All you were right. saying, what was my favorite? My mm-hmm. favorite was probably triple jump. I love the complexity, the the technique of it. Okay. What exactly is triple jump as someone who definitely was not an athlete as a child and did not do <laughs> track and field? <laughs> All right. So picture a long jump pit. So you have a long running aisle, kind of mm-hmm. like a red carpet leading to a sand pit. And instead of there just being one white strip before the sand pit where you take off, the white bar is much further away from the sand and you do a hop, skip and a jump before you enter the pit. Oh. So you have like a you have a build up of three jumps in it, in themselves before you leap into the sand and you try and go as far as you can. Okay. I I assume the ryth- uh, the rhythmic gymnastics might have helped you out a little bit here. You know, probably, but also the basketball because there's a lot about you can't travel, you can't there's so many rules in basketball, you know, you have to always dribble while doing certain moves. So I think everything did play, came into play for, for triple jump. Plus, I just, I was very good at just getting rhythm down. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I love rhythm. I also played in band, so maybe that helped. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Okay, so... We figured out how these three sports, rhythmic gymnastics, basketball, and track and field, can kind of go together. But then you go and become a pro cyclist. How does that happen? So, as you can probably tell, um, I love doing a lot. And sometimes a lot is too much. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So, during my final year um, of college, when I was running track and field as well for our team, um, they had a vision of me being really good at seven events. So I, within two weeks, I tried to get ready for an invitational race in Tennessee. And I was training about four hours a day on a track that was not the newest. And I totally overtrained my body and my body just gave up. So I had a stress fracture in my foot and I kept training because I have very high pain tolerance Mm -hmm. and I broke my foot. I I broke my navicular bone, had to have surgery, and ended up finishing undergrad on crutches and in a cast. Oh. So that was that. Um, I learned my lesson the hard way to always listen to your body if you can and not to overdo it. And so I came out. I'd already applied for grad school, had been accepted out here in Monterey, and came out here to continue my studies at the Monterey Institute of International Studies for grad school. So as I was recovering from my injury, I decided, well, I don't have a car. I need to get a bike. Ah. So I got a bike to originally just commute around town because, um, you know, my foot wasn't the strongest yet. I was going to physical therapy, but also I wanted to explore. The Consummate Athlete Podcast is part of the Wide Angle Podium Network. Supporting Wide Angle Podium gets you access to podcasts like ours and keeps your favorite shows on the air and constantly improving. You also get access to rad bonus content when you donate. Check out WideAnglePodium.com for show information, other Wide Angle Podium podcasts, and to become a donating member with awesome bonuses. You'll help support the Consummate Athlete Podcast, and every donation helps us keep improving the quality of the show. Again, that URL is wideanglepodium.com slash donate. Thanks for any support. The bike was that beginning from commuting to exploring, to exploring some more, to really getting into it, to going, going on bike rides that would take half the day, to just Going in between classes, it became part of what I did every day. So my final year at in grad school, so it was a two-year program, the, the second year, 
I ran into this guy who's super into bikes, and we started dating. And he's like, hey, you're pretty fast. (laughs) Have you you thought about racing? And so my boyfriend, current boyfriend, and um, his name's Chris, he encouraged me to join the, the team that he was on at the time, the Monterey Bay Racing Team. It's our local uh, racing squad, and I did. So as the only female on the team, I was I started training and riding and then racing with the guys. And so that's how I got into racing in 2014. Okay, that's awesome. So when you started doing the endurance, was that a huge change in terms of your training? Or had you always been doing some endurance within the confines of, you know, all the other sports you were doing? Especially running. Yeah. Yeah. So endurance, I would say with running, you're always, you always have that um, endurance aspect with basketball. Believe it or not, there's a lot to it that I think people can find exhausting, you know, in in practices in the team, you're always, you're constantly running. Mm -hmm. You you know, if the team does something wrong, you're like, Hey, get on the line, you know, do some suicide runs. So you're, the punishment is running. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so there's always some kind of, um, of, um, resilience through, Hey, how, how far can you go and how focused can you stay for that entire time? So I think that's why in basketball, one of the, the reasons why practices are so long is to, to train the body of all these various athletes to stay mentally intact for three hours. Even though a game might not total that time, it's still you have to stay sharp, sharp for that entire time for mm-hmm. a game. So and you, so, um, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, you almost have an advantage to like against people who've grown up with more of the endurance sport, like bike race mentality. Like I came into it and for me, three hour races, like staying focused is so hard because that's not, you know, like I was riding a bike before this, like biking, you zone out, but you have that like laser focus for three hours that you already know how to do. That's awesome. I think I had the strategy of, uh, staying sharp, but racing is, such a different sport from any other sport that I've ever done. It's incomparable. Mm -hmm. I, I've, I'd never experienced racing until I really put my mind into just racing. So, Mm -hmm. you know, you kind of, you were talking about how, how didn't I find my way to triathlon? Well, the first year that I started racing, so that was in 2014, I was also, since I was gaining fitness again, after my injury, I was also running again because I loved running. And I was swimming on and off because I love to swim. I'm a natural swimmer. Mm -hmm. And so I actually did do two triathlons, uh, sprint triathlons, and I did a half marathon and a marathon. Just, you um, know, casual. Yeah, exactly. Of course. I just, you know, got up and ran. Now, I, I definitely trained for all those events, but I didn't discover how important as a cyclist it is to just focus on cycling until 2015. So in 2015, that was kind of the beginning to, to definitely focusing in on cycling and taking it serious. Okay. So where did the, uh, the DNA team that you're on now come in? The first year that I was exploring kind of guest riding and going to the bigger events, I was racing for LA sweat. Uh, for part of the year and then I was unattached for the latter portion of the of that same year so DNA um, actually saw me racing at a lot of the big events like Joe Martin stage race and Cascade cycling classic as well as um, Redland so they had an eye on me I think at that point because I did pretty well in some of those uh, guest riding situations. And then they asked me to join their team in 2016. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah, so I've been with them now for two years. Cool. So what's what's your race schedule look like for this year? So this year is a little bit different um, than last year. Our team is not UCI, uh, which means we're just not going to some of the bigger events this year. But that doesn't exclude them. And for me, I really love 
the spontaneity of just, you know, either booking a flight and hopping on a plane to, to go some, to some exotic place, mm-hmm. but also uh, training throughout the entire year and um, having multiple phases of an on year, like, you know, picking an event, a target event in the spring, another target event in the summer, and another one in the fall. So for me, this year, um, I started with, I did Chico Stage Race early on. That was um, at the end of February. Then I did, um, uh, let's see here, uh, San Dimas Stage Race. That was also recently in March. And then now I'm kind of focusing on some of the bigger races here in Northern California, to prepare for the summer and our team is also doing a lot of uh, adventure races and gravel races since that's becoming kind of a a hot topic these days Mm -hmm. yeah nice so besides that i think um, i'm also gonna venture onto the dirt and do some (gasps) mountain biking and i'm still planning to get a cyclocross bike so maybe in the fall i'll be heading up (laughs) Yeah, going to doing some cyclocross events. That's awesome. You guys have some really good ones out in California. Yeah, I think it's it's the perfect spot. You know, like you said, we it's beautiful. We don't have that harsh of a winter. We can train all year. We can ride all year, and we have everything from sandy beaches where you can you know take a fat bike out there to um, wilderness where you can do cyclocross, mountain bike trails, and and good road races as well. So you can do mm-hmm. everything. Yeah, seriously. It's the the commercials are true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you're doing all of this. How on earth are you balancing training, you know, seriously with full time work? How does that how does that look? So it's definitely difficult, but it's not undoable or non doable, I guess. Uh I like I I kind of told you um I've been doing this basically my entire life. I've almost had a double life. Mm-hmm. You know, all the time. I'm whether it's with academics and um and now it's work. So I've always done some sport at the top level of whatever my age is at the time and also combining it with a full whether it's a family life or um, yeah, just a, a full year of school or college or now grad school and now it's a full-time job. So there's been something alongside those athletic endeavors my entire life. So I think I'm pretty good at balancing everything, mm-hmm. um, but it definitely helps to have an incredible support structure um, in, in my family. Everybody's either on board and also athletically gifted and they're also doing that. I'm my dad's doing triathlons. My sisters at high school were also playing sports. And uh, my mom has been such a supportive figure in my life that um, it's never, it never occurred to me that it wouldn't be possible mm-hmm. to do everything. And so now um, being an adult, uh, my boyfriend also races. So that's incredibly helpful. Mm-hmm. You know, we train together. We go to races together. It just it makes it so much more fun to be on the road together. Um, and it definitely helps when you're looking for what races to do to be yeah. able to plan that with another person. Yeah, for sure. I think for me, I, I think about this a lot. I can't actually imagine not doing work and training. Like even when I was racing really seriously, I think I always kind of needed another thing and that was, you know, work or school. Cause I think I would actually go crazy if all I had to do was train and race. Yeah, I I've definitely been in those shoes too where I'm like, well, what if how would how would the day look like if I didn't have work to go to? I think I would just go get bored. Exactly. I, mean, I would ride <laughs> ride all day and that's I mean counterintuitive if you were just doing if you were riding for, you know, yeah. 10 hours every <laughs> single day. I mean, what are you going to get get from that? I mean, you should better be a ultra endurance um, cyclist of some sort, you know, go across the country or something. Yeah, right. (laughs) But uh, I've always loved having that balance of something else that you can um, just challenge yourself at Mm -hmm. and be happy with. So 
I, I can't even imagine another way. Yeah, exactly. So on that yeah. note, since you're not riding 10 hours a day, what does the average training week look like for you? And obviously it changes throughout the year, but say like right now, so we're in the season. So on average, um, during the week, I train for about 10 to anywhere 20, 20 hours a week. And it really depends on it, whether it's an on week or a recovery week. I try to do you know three on weeks and then take a, a rest week. Mm -hmm. So during the rest week, for example, I try to minimize um, the time that I spend on a bike from 45 minutes to an hour and really keeping in mind that this time should be used to really recover. Mm -hmm. It's mentally and physically. Um, on the other side, when you're, when it's, you know, an on week, um, I still have one day of recovery. So typically Mondays, just because I'm racing on the weekend. So Mondays are a good time to take some, take a break, take a breather, maybe not even get on the bike at all. <gasps> and then Tuesday, getting it, yeah, getting into it again. And, and then Wednesdays having a good effort day so anywhere between an hour and a half at the minimum to you know three hours type bike ride and mm -hmm. then on the weekends either i'm racing or i'm doing all the group rides in town so we have a very good fast uh group ride on saturday mornings it's called our saturday morning ride here in monterey and basically everybody who's either been a racer or is currently a racer shows up so it's really difficult really hard and um, we go to town. So, and then, of course, like any other bike ride, it ends with a coffee stop. Of course. <laughs> nice. Yeah. And then what about, do you still get any running in? Do you do any strength or flexibility work or anything like that? During the off season, I try to include swimming in my routine. So twice a week, I, I like to go to the gym and go swim. There's a good... Um, endurance swim class actually so it's pretty difficult it's an, a full intense one hour swim class and um, there's a coach there it's it's the master swim class so um she here in town it's uh, her name's terry she prescribes the the night's workout and everybody really tries to go hard and challenge each other i do that and then i typically just do some core strengthening at home mm -hmm. after a ride or when I'm watching a movie, but I don't have a specific weightlifting uh, core and stability workout regimen that I, you know, adhere to. Yeah. I love swimming for kind of counterbalancing, I think, some of the effects of cycling on the body. So it's one of my favorite things. Oh, yeah. Ugh. It's it's phenomenal what swimming can do for your back strengthening and core. Mm -hmm. I definitely noticed that every single time I spend a month in the pool, my core is, you know, just tougher. And I feel like I've worked out my, my back without having to go to, you know, a weight room and pushing weights. It's, it's so different. And, um, and, and it's a full body exercise. Mm -hmm. You know, you feel exhausted afterwards. So you really get a wholesome, the wholesome experience of, um, of exercising and, um, and it's non weight bearing. So it's great. Yeah, exactly. Um, so since you, since you got into cycling in 2014, so gosh, four, four years ago now, uh, um, what sort has anything changed? Like, was there anything that you were doing back in 2014 that you look back at now and you're like, Oh God, what was I thinking? Hmm. I guess, has your training I, really evolved in any, like, major way, or have you just, you know, gotten faster? Yeah, I've definitely made some huge strides when it comes to my overall fitness. And I think I would attribute that to just understanding there's a time to, to recover and a time to go hard. Mm -hmm. uh, when I first got into cycling, I definitely thought that there was one speed, and that was to go fast. And now there really are so many different speeds and every single ride has a purpose and really understanding that makes your training more efficient and just you as an athlete more productive when you're actually trying to get better. So if I could look at my 
um, my, you know, beginner cyclist self, I would say, hey, take a break. Don't, you don't <laughs> have to push on the pedal so hard all the time. It's, it's not worth it, you know. Maybe focus on your diet a little bit more. Um, yeah. Reduce. Reduce all the all the trail mix you're consuming. So maybe <laughs> you know just one bag instead of every single day you've got one. Oh my so, gosh, I know exactly so really, what you mean with the trail mix. It is it is a bad news when you go down that rabbit hole. It really hole. is. <laughs> yeah, you know what? As a cyclist, I think that's the one thing too. You're always hungry after a ride. You yeah. will go for anything, and I think everybody craves sugar. So. For me, the, my downfall is always chocolate, but also dried fruit. And Trader Joe's is like my favorite place to go. So I'll get dried mangoes or dried peaches, dried <laughs> dried whatever in a fruit. Yep. And those things, they have a lot of calories. So not that I'm calorie counting, but that's definitely something to keep in mind, that there are foods that will help you and foods that will hurt you. Yeah, which actually leads into what we are going to talk about next, which is just how has your diet kind of evolved over time? And yeah, what's what's a day of eating look like for you now? So um, a year ago, Chris and I, we were both trying to target Chico and well, it was a really rainy winter for us. And we're like, oh, you know, I, we need to lose like five pounds just to be in the <laughs> race weight, you know? You know, everybody has like a target weight, and for us, we we had our mind set on something. So, for me, um, actually, he introduced me to it. We both um, were reading all these different articles, doing our research, and we tried the 16-hour fast. And so, for me, that was um, you basically just to describe it. It you pick a time that you want to push your body to kind of be fasting up until, so let's pick, for example, noon. So you don't have anything up until noon. And then from noon on, you could eat whatever you wanted until 8. And okay. then after 8, you have 16 hours until the next time. Ooh, so I would not be good on that diet. I will just put that out there right now. <laughs> So for anybody who loves food, and I'm sure you fall into that too, and if you're competitive like me, I'm sure you could do it as well. It's it's a fight for the first couple of days to try and not. So I was used to eating breakfast, and I eat you know sometimes at six, seven, whenever I woke up, and so that was the biggest challenge to not have anything up until noon. But once you get started on it, and once you tried it, once your body got accustomed to just not having anything before lunch, I was fine. And it was fun. It was a fun challenge. Again, kind of like a competition. Mm-hmm. Everything is competitive. <laughs> uh, it, it was a challenge to try and go, okay, well, I'll have my coffee, but no creamer. Because you want to go calorie-free up until lunch. So that really became part of what I do. Um, but no, I'm much more lenient when it comes to that. I'll have, you know... Um, so I'm lactose intolerant, so I have soy milk in my coffee in the morning. Um, sometimes if I'm out at a coffee shop and they don't have anything like that, I'll, you know, add, add some kind of sweetener to it just so that it's not too acidic. I don't really like that coffee acidic flavor. So, mm-hmm. uh, But it's something you get used to. So, But besides that, um, actually... Um, this year, I discovered my little secret ingredient, and it's spirulina. Yeah, so, let's, let's talk about that. How did you come yeah. across it? You know, funny story is, I, I was just, you know, like these days, everybody's glued to social media, and I was just browsing along, and I came across this Instagram post, and it's called SP2 Life. I was like, what's that? And my boyfriend's like, hey check out what they have, SB2, it's spirulina. Haven't you tried a sp- uh, spirulina before? And so I was like, huh, you know what? In college I did, but I tried it as a powder. And, you know, I wasn't really into it. I didn't feel any different. I didn't notice any significant, you know, increase in my muscles for basketball or whatever. <laughs> so I was like, okay, well, I'll, I'll check them out and, and maybe, you know, maybe I'll try it. And so I uh, met the owner of the company 
name is Adam. And we got talking and he's like, yeah, you should, you should, you got to just try it. You really just got to try it because it's so different from the powder form. I was like, all right, convince me. So he gave me some samples and I, I tried it for a month. And for us in town, there's this one. Have you heard of Strava? Mm-hmm. Of course. Okay. Well, everything is about Strava these days. Naturally. So, <laughs> <laughs> there's this one segment that everybody in town likes to, you know, go at and try their best at on these Saturday morning rides. So I said, okay, Adam, you know, I'll give it a, a shot. After a month, I'm going to go try my best on the segment. So for the last year, I've been trying to get a new personal record on this one segment. It's called the A-Ride, A-Climb. It's like the climb in town to get a good time on. And for a year, I couldn't beat my time. Um, I was glued to the same time. The best I could do was 10 minutes and 5 seconds. And the girl who had the best time did it in 9 minutes and 55 seconds. So that was the time to beat. Okay, so a month after being on Spirulina, I finally got a chance to to try the segment. The weather was good, people showed up, and we went at it. Well, I was blown away by the results for me on that day. I didn't just get a PR, but I smashed the best time for the women. So instead of not being able to get a, a lower time than 10 minutes I now did it in nine minutes and 28 seconds so I was I was just like wow what was going on today so that kind of that was um one of those light bulb moments of man you know this this really has changed something in my overall health and fitness and I became a believer in it so I've been using spirulina so now this is a fresh raw uh, spirulina form. It comes in these uh, little rectangular pods, and I use it on a daily basis. Just one of the pods, you know, I pop it out of its little shell into a smoothie. I mix it with orange juice, carrot juice, a little soy milk, some some frozen fruit, blend it up, and I have that for lunch. It's perfect. Nice. I'm not going to lie, I'm totally just sitting on my Strava right now, like, trying to look through last time I was in Monterey, because I know I was on, like, one of the rides that has, like, a billion segments, and I'm just like, huh. Oh, yeah, we have probably 400 segments for... It's it's ridiculous. It's, like, a (laughs) 30-mile ride. It's like, you have 75 segments. (laughs) You did well. (laughs) Nice work. Yeah. um, We are all average... Java hours here. So uh, it's difficult to find an area where there are no segments. Yeah, it's pretty ridiculous just like glancing through this. Um, anyway, yeah, the uh, the spirulina thing's interesting to me because I remember hearing a ton about it when I was back in my like vegan days. So in my early 20s. Mm-hmm. And you don't yeah. really hear about it when you're not into the whole vegan thing, I feel like. So, um, I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, but I've basically been a vegetarian all my life. And I have definitely changed my diet here and there to kind of fit the times of my life and the location of where I was living at. Mm -hmm. So um, when I was growing up, I never liked meat. Uh, My dad enjoyed medium rare steaks. And I could not stand the sight of blood in my food. And I would always ask my mom, you know, can you cut it out really, really thin <laughs> and burn it? And then I'll eat it. Just because I I didn't like the taste. It wasn't for the ethical reasons. It was for the taste. And so as I was getting older, I started really enjoying nature and caring for the environment. More and more, yeah, I did care about the animals. But still, because I just never got into loving meat, I never really cared for cooking it either. So for me, I've basically been unintentionally what they call now vegan all my life, just because I never really felt attached to those the items that are kind of on the, hey, if you're a vegan, you wouldn't want, you don't eat this and this and that. Mm-hmm. So for me, it was just conscious eating. 
it was just a part of maybe growing up in Europe too, because depending on where you are, you know, people think differently, people act differently. So maybe not a full Orthodox vegan, but at the same time, I'm a conscious eater. And um, I unintentionally became lactose intolerant just because as I was going to undergrad, I actually phased out dairy. And so I think that changed what my body was able to digest. And um, instead of dairy milk, I was uh, I was drinking rice milk and almond milk. And so I just had a much lower tolerance to what was in typical milk. So I, I stopped eating cheese. I stopped um, drinking milk. And um, I don't eat meat. So for me, all of those things have built up. And I think the one significant um, benefit of spirulina, of raw spirulina, and I think SP2 really um, has has discovered this, is you have highly concentrated protein in this one product and B12. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of times when you're taking the supplements, your body doesn't actually digest, absorb all the nutrients that it's advertised to to benefit your body. But in the raw form, your body is able to absorb it mm-hmm. and do something with it in a productive way. So for me, I think that's exactly maybe that one thing that I've never really had. So maybe I was the perfect test subject, too, for, hey, you know, take someone who's, who doesn't eat meat and suddenly add this natural protein to their diet, which the body is able to digest. You're just able to convert it into energy and do something with it, helps you recover your muscles and just become a better athlete because, hey, that's what I love doing. So, I love that. Um, And then as far as recipes go, so you use it in smoothies. Have you done anything else with it or have you pretty much just stuck to smoothies, which I feel like is kind of the definitely the obvious (laughs) way way to do it? So here's the awesome thing about um, the way that SP2 um, has figured it out. The raw form, the fresh spirulina, is actually odorless and tasteless. So uh, it might have like a little bit of an earthy taste to it, but not even as strong as like, say, beet juice. You know, beet juice has like a typical earthiness to it. Spirulina doesn't. Mm -hmm. And so you can add it to anything and it will taste phenomenally like what you're putting into it so for me my my go-to is a smoothie but at the same time um when i was going to the san dima stage race i was staying with one of my friends and i didn't you know didn't have everything that i typically would add to my smoothie with me so on and off i would even um i was there for three days i would even just drop one of the pods into a water bottle mix it with a little bit of electrolyte mix and just shake it Wow. And since it's a fro, it's it's a frozen, um, concentrated form of spirulina. It just dissolves, and uh, when when it becomes, you know, engulfed in water, it, it basically it just mixes with what you're putting into it. So um, you could just drink it like that, and you I get all that. the benefits. Such so a phenomenal. Sneaky. Um, <laughs> yeah, you could you could just just don't be surprised. You know, you're. You're trying to splash your face with water, and actually, you're just, <laughs> there's green <laughs> stuff coming out of it. So, be careful with that. Don't forget. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. All right. And then, last thing, where can people find you online to keep up with all of your adventures, other than obviously mm. Strava, which is where I'm going to have to follow you next? Yeah, phenomenal. Yes. Um, I'm on Instagram. My Instagram handle is Hannah Muge, so H A N N A M U E G G E. I'm also on Facebook. Again, my full name, so Hannah H A N N A, and then my last name is M U E G G E. And I'm also on Twitter, though I'm not that active, but same thing, Hannah H A N N A, and then Muge M U E G G E. It's all together, lower cap. Perfect. We'll have all those links in the show notes. I do love your Instagram. It's so bright and fun. Yay! Awesome. Yeah. Instagram is awesome. Mm-hmm. 
Very cool. Oswald, thank you so much for taking time to chat, especially after a long work day. It's very appreciated. Yeah. No, I love talking to you. So I really appreciate what you do and um, can't wait to hear the podcast. Hey guys, I just wanted to talk to you for a hot minute about Health IQ. So it's not really that fun to talk about life insurance, but what about life insurance that actually cares about your Strava results and race results? That's pretty sweet. So Health IQ is a life insurance company that promotes a health conscious lifestyle through financial rewards, which means they've got special rates for cyclists, runners, triathletes, and other health conscious people. Uh, They've used science to kind of come up with these lower rates on life insurance for people who are exercising, say, four times a week, um, because, you know, research has shown that people who are highly active, you know, by exercising have a 22% lower cancer risk, 50% lower heart risk, and a 34% risk, lower risk of early death. So, you know, many people who are doing this regular exercise training for, you know, whatever event don't realize you can get a special rate on your life insurance through Health IQ by qualifying through the Health IQ quiz that they have online or, you know, even submitting those Strava's and race results, which is pretty sick. Uh, You can learn more and get a quote on your life insurance over at healthiq.com slash C-A-P-O-D. So healthiq.com slash C A pod. So check it out, browse the website, take the quiz, and you know, submit your Strava results. Thanks so much for tuning into the Consummate Athlete Podcast. Uh, you can check out my stuff over at theoutdooredit.com or by following me on Instagram and Twitter at Molly J. Herford. And you can check out Peter's coaching, training plans, blogs, all that fun stuff over at smartathlete.ca or by following him on Twitter and Instagram, at Peter Glassford. And if you want to support this show and other awesome podcasts, please check out WideAnglePodium.com for show info, other podcasts, bonus content, and to become a donating member so you can get all of that rad behind-the-scenes content and help keep shows like this on the air. And lastly, if you're enjoying this podcast and all the information that we're bringing to you every single week, Uh, Do us a solid and pop into iTunes to leave us a rating and review. It takes you about two seconds. You can do it on your computer. You can do it on your phone. And it really helps us out. Thanks so much. And we will see you next week.